Hi folks, it's good to be with you uh, today, this afternoon. Um, I'll just pray, pray before we start. Father, as we come before you today, we acknowledge that in the flesh there is no good thing. And your servant today is weak, frail, and cannot do this in his own strength. So I ask, Father God, that you pour out your Holy Spirit in my own heart. But also, Father, that each person here today that you would minister to them and Father speak to them tenderly and that Father each person here Lord that you would minister to their hearts and that Father they would hear that still small voice and I pray Father God that you would comfort your people today and Father all of us would leave this house feeling comforted uh, from you Father so Father, we bow before you today and we ask for your blessings, your comfort and your encouragement, not in our own righteousness, but in Jesus Christ. In you, Lord, we ask, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, these three are one. Amen. 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 If you'd like to turn to uh, Hebrews chapter 13, verse 5, that's what we're looking at today. Hebrews chapter 13, uh, verse 5. <clears throat> Hebrews chapter 13, verse 5. And the title of the sermon is, Never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. Never will I leave you, and never will I forsake you. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 5 says, let your manner of life be without covetousness, and be content with such things as you have. For he said, I will never leave thee, nor forsake thee. And it's those words, I will never leave thee, nor forsake thee. I will never leave thee, nor forsake thee, that I want to just talk about today. It says, uh, Elizabeth Elliot says, you are loved with an everlasting love and, and, and underneath are the everlasting arms. Elizabeth Elliot said she lost her husband who was killed as a missionary and she says, you are loved with everlasting love and underneath are the everlasting arms. And sometimes in our lives we, we need to know that God is with us. We, feel uh, we need that assurance as we face the trials and difficulties of life. And God has been speaking to us as a church about this through Praveen and, and my messages uh, that God is with us. Um, George Muller, who fed thousands of young children, uh, one day ran out of food for the children. And it was a big orphanage and he had no food to feed the kids. So he said to the children, we'll pray. And on that day, there was a baker walking past and felt a need to go to the orphanage and said, the Lord has told me to come and gave the orphanage a load of bread to feed the children that day. God was with George Muller and God is with you today to help you to meet your need at this time in your life. It says in Hebrew, uh, in Deuteronomy chapter 31 verse 6, Be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid or terrified of them. For the Lord your God goes with you. And then it says, I will never leave you nor forsake you. It will never leave you or forsake you when you're feeling inadequate. It will never leave you or forsake you when you're feeling inadequate. It says, I will never leave you nor forsake thee. When a child uh, goes from nursery to school, to infant school, 
That little child is often very feeling inadequate. Mommy, 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 I don't want to go. Come on now, we've got to go. You've got to grow up. You've got to leave nursery. You've got to go to school. Mommy, I can't cope with it. <laughs> you can do it. And we're like that as adults. When life changes, we move house or, or you get married or a new job or you lose someone in your life or whatever. When life changes and things are not familiar, we can feel inadequate. Do you feel inadequate in life's changes in your life? God promises you that in your inadequacy, He will give you strength. Habakkuk chapter 3 verse 19, The Sovereign Lord gives me strength. He makes me sure-footed as a deer and keeps me safe uh, on the mountains. It says uh, in Deuteronomy 20 verse 4, the Lord God is going with you. He will give you the victory. He will give you the strength to, to overcome your inadequacies and the problems that you face. And do you remember Jeremiah, the young prophet? He was very inadequate. He was a young man and God had called him to ministry, but he felt he couldn't do it. In Jeremiah chapter 1 verse 6, I do not know how to speak, he said. And then in verse 8, do not be afraid of them, for I am with you and I will rescue you. So if you feel inadequate today, God is saying to you, I will give you the strength and I will help you. Okay. Hebrews chapter 13 verse 5, I will never leave you nor forsake you when you feel you lack supply. When you feel you lack supply. Has anybody got any financial difficulties today? Do you feel like catch-up? Do you, do, you, do you play catch-up when it comes to finances? You know, you pay a bill and you catch up to pay that bill and then suddenly another bill comes and you're catching up to pay that. And it's like, oh, it's a never-ending worry for you financially. Elizabeth Elliot said, God works, uh, God work, God's work done in God's way never lacks supply. Amen. You live the way God wants you to live, either in ministry or in your home, and God will supply your need. Philippians 4.19 But my God shall supply all your need according to His riches in glory by Christ Jesus. Philippians 4.19 I'll give you an example how God provides your need. You see that camera there? I have a camera when I go into town to, to film. And uh, the camera was in a bag underneath the table with a stick. Somebody came and stole my camera. And uh, I prayed about it, because we need a camera. Sometimes if the police come, we can record them or anybody causes trouble. And we needed a camera and I prayed about it. and. A Pakistani Christian man was walking past and he saw one of my helpers preaching with a small mic. I, I couldn't be out that day. I was at home. So the young man gave him my contact and this man wanted to buy me a speaker. Well, I've got speaker. I've got speaker. I'm okay with speaker. I said, I'm okay. He said, well, can I help you in any way? I said, I, well, I need a camera. Within 10 minutes, he transferred the money in my account and I was able to buy a camera. God will meet your need financially, whatever your needs are. Thirdly, uh, never will I leave you or forsake you when you face tragedy. In Christ the Rock community, uh, just a year ago, a pastor called Bill Lenz took his own life. Bill had been suffering from depression uh, for three months and he committed suicide. Some families go through tremendous tragedy. Only about six weeks ago, I was at a funeral where a, a young man had committed suicide. Uh, there are over 5,000 people a year who commit suicide in the UK and in America, over 44,000 people a year commit suicide. So maybe there's a family here today who knows somebody who's 
or a some family that has had a member commit suicide. I cannot even imagine what that would feel like if my brother or someone in my family committed suicide. But maybe you know somebody. And God says to that family, and he says to you, never will I leave you nor forsake you. And then there is bereavement when we lose a loved one. When we lose a mother or a father or someone we love, there is something, says Susan Wig, there is something about losing a mother that is permanent, inexpressible, a wound that will never quite heal. So in tragedy, when somebody commits suicide or we lose a loved one, God promises this, Psalm 147 verse 3, He heals the brokenhearted and binds up the wounds. Psalm 73 26, my flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength and joy and uh, portion forever. Romans 8, 28, and we know that all things work together for good to those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. God will comfort the family and the person who goes through tragedy if they call upon him. I will never leave you nor forsake you when you're feeling or have been rejected. Praveen mentioned it last week and maybe this is something somebody needs to hear again about rejection. You've been rejected. A uh, schoolboy has spots and he turns up at school and he's got big juicy spots all over his face and everybody's rejecting him and calling him spotty face. And we all go through that kind of rejection even in adulthood. People reject us for whatever reason. And it's not easy to face. Well, Jesus faced rejection in John chapter 1 verse 11. He came to his own and his own people did not receive him. So if you've been rejected, you're in good company because Jesus was rejected. And he knows how you're feeling. Psalm 27 verse 10. For my father and my mother have forsaken me, but the Lord will take me in. And Jeremiah 29, 11, it doesn't matter if people reject you. It doesn't matter what people think of you. At the end of the day, if you believe in God, God is with you. Amen. Jeremiah 29, verse 11, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare and not for evil, to give you a, fruit, uh, a fruitful uh, f uh, fruit and a hope. God has plans for you, no matter what anybody else thinks of you. So don't let rejection pull you down. Isaiah 49, 15. Can a worm forget her nursing... Uh, can, can a woman forget her nursing child that she should have no compassion on the son of a womb? Even these may forget, yet I will not forget you. God will not forget you. You're not left on the shelf. Your life is not hopeless just because someone has rejected you. Even though it may be painful. Even though it may break your heart. And sometimes those who are closest to us. Sometimes those who, who we respect. Can reject us. And it can break our heart. But we need to know that God is with us. And he has plans for us and loves us. Never will I leave you or forsake you. When you lack assurance. Never will I leave you or forsake you when, I, when you lack for assurance. And uh, Hebrews 13, 5, it says, Never will I leave you nor forsake you. Do you feel like the Christian life is like being in a spider's web? You know a fly flies into the spider's web and the spider is creeping down to get the, the fly, but the fly is just trying to wiggle out and can't seem to get out. Is that how you feel sometimes in the Christian life, that it's a struggle, that you just can't seem to make any progress, that you seem to be trapped, and you wish you had peace, you wish you had joy, but it's like you're wiggling like a fly in the web of life. God wants you to have assurance in 1 John chapter 5 verse, I think it's 13. Three things I have written to you who believe in 
the name of the Son of God so that you may know you have eternal life. If you want to know assurance in your life, if you want to know whether you're a Christian, if you want peace in your life, look to Jesus. Look to Jesus. You say, Jay, I feel so sinful. Yeah, but don't look at your sin. Look at Jesus. Jay, I'm so worried. Now stop looking at the worry. Look at Jesus. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 22. Let us draw near with a sincere heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with the pure water. If you want assurance, think of the blood of Jesus. Think about what the blood signifies, that the blood has taken away your guilt. In John 6, 47, Truly, truly, I say to you, he who believes has eternal life. If you want to have assurance of salvation, have faith in Jesus. Faith. Faith. Believe, trust, and you'll grow in assurance. Faith will overcome your sin. Faith will overcome your doubt. Faith in Christ will strengthen you. Ask God to give you strength. Ask God to give you faith. And faith will overcome. Never will I leave you nor forsake you with a crisis. When you're in a crisis. Sometimes our lives can be like a Jeremy Kyle show. Have you seen Jeremy Kyle? Yeah. <laughs> to get someone on stage. Some woman and some bloke comes on and says, You slept with my... Uh, somebody else and it's all oh my giddy hand shouting match sometimes our lives can be like that it can be a shouting match in the family you just turn up with the family and, uh, and, 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 and you're just chilling out and then next thing you know you like this what, what, what are you arguing for what, what, what's it all what's, why is everybody arguing what, what, what's it all about what, what? and then you're drawn into it and it's a crisis it's not really a crisis but everybody's making it a crisis and you lose your peace. But in Philippians chapter 4 verse 6 and 7 it says, Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, may your request be known to God. Now, I won't tell you the details, but uh, two of my sisters were having an argument last week. And they were not getting on. And it was upsetting my mum. So... I said, Mom, you pray, I pray. So we prayed. And within two, three days, it was sorted. They were all best of friends. But at the time, major crisis. If you pray about it and leave it with the Lord, He'll work in that crisis. Okay? Number seven. Never will I leave you nor forsake you with, when you're in a difficult marriage. When you're in a difficult marriage. He said, Jay, I... <laughs> Jay... You know, I don't have no problems in my marriage, bro. <laughs> my marriage is sweet. Well, my friends, I'm, I don't like to say it, but you're either deluded or you're lying. Because every marriage will have some problem at some stage. Yes. And uh, just be honest about it. If you encourage fakeness, you know if you encourage fakeness, everybody pretends everything's all right in a marriage or in your life, you all go around, you pretend everything's all right in your life. Listen, every one of us here has got struggles and battles and we can be honest about it. But if you encourage people or if you encourage yourself just to pretend, then what we're doing is we're, we're little Pharisees. We've all got weaknesses and we've all got struggles. And in marriage, God has promised that he'll be with us. It says in Luke chapter 1 verse 37, nothing is impossible for God. So when you're looking at your marriage partner and you feel it's impossible that they'll change, it's impossible they'll, underst they'll not understand you, then it's possible if you pray and ask God to help. Even the best marriages have struggled. Francis Schaeffer, a man who I admire, a great Christian apologist, his marriage sometimes had difficult times. If you look at Ephesians chapter 5 verse 33, that is the image that if you go to it in your marriage, you'll be strengthened. It says, husband love your wife as Christ loved the church. So if the husband has that humility and love, then it will bring peace. 
And if the woman honors her husband, it will bring peace. So Ephesians 5.33, God has given you the word. The answer to your problem in your marriage is God has given it to you right there. I guarantee if you follow those words, you will not need counseling. You will not need any help in your marriage. If you obey both of you, Ephesians 5.33, put that into practice, I guarantee peace will reign in your marriage. It's basically just loving one another. Um, number eight, uh, never will I leave you nor forsake you when you have opposition. When you have opposition, we've nearly finished now. When you have opposition, uh, in if Hebrews 13, 5, it says, never will I leave you nor forsake you. What I'm doing is I'm just, I've got one nail today. Never will I leave you nor forsake you. And I'm just hammering that one nail in our hearts today. That one nail. Uh, if you think in your Christian life you will not have opposition, then you're going to be disappointed. Because you will get opposition. The more you love God, the more you want God, the more opposition you'll get. The more you do for God, the more opposition you get. The higher up in the things of God, if you become a pastor or if you become a leader, you will have even more opposition. Because Satan wants to bring you down. David Brainard, a missionary, uh, was studying at college uh, 200 years ago and he got kicked out of college. Uh, and he was a man of God. He got kicked out because he wanted to pray in the college, a Bible college. And when he was mission, doing mission work to Indians, they were getting drunk, the Indians in America. And they weren't listening to him. And it was opposition. It was difficult. But he prayed and he worked it through. But uh, Praveen, oh, it doesn't matter. If we could go to, I've just, I, I wrote most of them down, but I, I didn't have time to write all of them down. But if you go to 2 Timothy uh, chapter 2, uh, 2 Timothy uh, chapter 2, verse 24 and 26. And the servant of the Lord must not strive, but... Be gentle unto all men, apt to teach and patient. In meekness instructing those who oppose him. If God perhaps will give them repentance to the knowledge of the truth. And that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil who were taken captive. So there is a, a picture of opposition in ministry. And we're to pray for opponents. And we're to pray for them. And be gentle with them. And uh, we to remember that in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10 and 20, if anybody in your life opposes your faith, maybe at work, maybe someone in your family, maybe someone in your ministry, if someone ever opposes you, remember it's not them, there's a demonic force behind them. It says in Ephesians 6, 10, it says, be strong, and then he says, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers. And so the enemy is using them to try and get at you. So don't take it personally when they're getting on your nerves and opposing you. There's a higher enemy and you have to take them out with prayer and put it on the full armor of God. But here's the point. You will have opposition. So you have to get used to it. All the days of your life, there will be opponents against you if you name the name of Christ. So you've got to toughen up. Not, not be a wimp and start crying. Going, <laughs> she doesn't like me. He doesn't like me. She's trying to uh, spoil my ministry. He's trying to break my ministry. You're going to get it, folks. You've got to be tough. You're, the, you're a royal marine in the things of God. And you've just got to realize, what about our Lord? What happened to Jesus? What happened to him? They crucified him. What about Paul? He was whipped and beaten. What about Perpetua, the, the great Christian woman who was put in the arena and fed to the lions? Latimer and Ridley fed to the lions. Did you know your Bible? The King James Bible was built on William Tyndale's translation. And William Tyndale wanted to translate the Bible for, so that an English so that a boy could read an English Bible and have more knowledge than a bishop? Because 
they only read in Latin, the bishops, and William Tyndale wanted the Bible in English so that the boys and the girls could read it. And what happened to William Tyndale? He was captured and he was killed for translating this book in English. So they had opposition and you get opposition. But the Lord says, never will I leave you nor forsake you. Amen. And then we come to the end. Dealing with, uh, never will I leave you nor forsake you when you're single. Hebrews 13.5 Never will I leave you nor forsake you when you're single. Singleness can be like a cold winter. Have you been in a cold winter like today? It was freezing today. I got here. I tell you what, I got out of that car. I was freezing. I had to run down the road and I was looking somewhere where I could get some warmth. I was absolutely freezing. But that can be what it's like when you're single. It can be cold. It can be lonely. It can be painful. It's not easy. And in that you can get desperate. I, I went on a date once with a lady, just to, just, to, just to lighten things up a little bit. I went on a date with this lady from a dating site, and I was sat there. And uh, the first minute I was dating her, she was looking around at other guys while I'm dating her, while I'm having, taking her out for a meal, her eyes are going, do, do, do. She gets back home, I phone her up, how you doing, how you doing? She says, I need a thousand pound. I thought, a thousand pound? And she said, I need this, I need that. I thought, I've always known you once, I'm not going out with you again. So don't get desperate. God knows your need, folks. He knows your need. I dated another lady, not just for a laugh. I dated another lady. I phoned her up, I said, What are you doing? She said, I'm going shopping. I said, Why are you going shopping? She says, I'm going to fill up the fill up the cellar with food. I said, Why are you filling up the cellar with food? She said, just in case it's the end times next week. <laughs> So I thought, uh, I forget that one. Anyhow, if you turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 7. 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 7. Sorry about this. Last, last, last scripture. 1 Corinthians 7, verse 7. For I wish that all men were even as myself, but each one has his own gift from God. One is this man and another. Thanks, bro. If you're in pain as a single person, you want to get married and you don't know why you're not married or you're struggling with that and struggling with the issue of being single, Paul here, this is a comforting word. What he's saying is if you're gifted to be single, be single. If you're gifted to be married, be married. If you have a desire to be married, get married. If you don't have a desire, don't get married. So if you're a single person today and you're struggling, well, what is the Lord's will? If he's given you a desire for marriage, then he'll fulfill that desire. So be patient and pray. He knows in Genesis 2, 18, he says it's not good for a man to be alone. He knows your need. He knows you need a husband and a wife. So be patient and God will provide. Do you remember Genesis 29, verse 9 and 10? God provided for Jacob, Rachel. He went to the well and boom, there she was. She was there. And God will bring the right man and the right woman in your path. Uh, just, a little, just a little word. I've been on dating sites. I don't think they're a good thing. I'm sure God can use them. But I don't think they're a good thing. Because at the end of the day, if God wants someone in your life, He, he will bring, it in, he bring that person into your life. And you'll know them. But if you're single and you're not married, and God will give you the peace to stay single if that's your calling. And if it's your calling to be married, be patient. And He will provide at the right time, He will give you the right person for you. So, we've come to the end. Never will I leave you or forsake you. In Exodus chapter 4, Moses was told to lead the people of God out of, out of Egypt. He felt inadequate, he felt he couldn't do it. And God said, take the staff, he said, I'll go with you. And today, God's telling you today, that some of us here today are feeling that there's change in our lives. And God is saying, never will I leave you or forsake you. 
He's saying that if there's problems in your marriage, never will, I, never will I leave you or forsake you. If there's problems in singleness, never will I leave you or forsake you. If there's problems financially, never will I leave you or forsake you. If there's problems with tragedy, someone you know who's committed suicide or bereaving, never will I leave you or forsake you. If there's a crisis in your family, he's saying never will I leave you or forsake you. God is assuring you.